here it is. <clears throat> but at some point, uh, I mean, even if it's not clear, I would like to, to clarify a point uh, regarding a question which was raised. You remember that I told you that in order to compute the coherence length in the case of turbulence, as opposed to reaction fusion, we need three conditions, okay? <coughs> One condition <coughs> is that, by definition, the coherence length is the length at which the coupling strength, remember that Reynolds is competition between diffusion and advection, and this competition is scale dependent. So by definition, the coherence length is the length at which the two mechanisms are just in exact balance. So that's definition. Plus, I told you that when people talk about Reynolds number in general, what they mean is the Reynolds number as a larger scale, which is this. And these two conditions are not enough. We have to supplement them with a, an expression which tells you how the velocity field is changing scale by scale. And the question was, well, but if I have this definition, okay, and you tell me that Reynolds of L critical is one, these two are sufficient to pin down the coherence length. Actually, this is not true for the simple reason that U at scale LC, oops, U at scale LC is at this point unknown. So I cannot just place L equal LC here and put it to equal to 1 and get the value LC because U will be U at scale LC, which I don't know. That's why I need this relation. I hope that's clear to everybody. Maybe you may, you may or may not remember the question, but I told him, I, I think my explanation was not clear enough. So there is, in the case of turbulence, since the velocity itself is changing with the scale, you need a further relation, which, as I told you, is drawn by, uh, by theory. And without that further relation, there is no way you can pin down the coherence length. <coughs> this is just a clarification for, from the previous lecture. So today, we, I planned, in fact, in the original plan, uh, today would have been a day for mathematical treatment uh, of uh, multiscale, I mean, the mathematical <laughs> presentation of the mathematical framework for multiscale, in particular, the mathematics of correlations. But I think we had enough theory last week, and so I decided to skip that. What is this? Oops. And uh, in there's something wrong. No, but I mean, OK. And go directly to the presentation of what I call an exercise. In fact, my lectures, in fact, have three parts. One which is theory, second which is exercises. And the third will be application, which is uh, current application of multiscale. And tomorrow, I think I will present that uh, uh, the, the lecture on the on the translocation of biopolymer. So this is in intermediate between <coughs> theory and uh, research, actual current research. And I, I will present what I believe is possibly one of the simplest instances of multiscale, where we couple, in fact, the fluid level. No, the, Oh, I, I pick up the wrong one. This is example two. I'm sorry. I should pick up dynamics. Example one. This was, I don't know what's going on here. There's something wrong in my computer. But it will come. I think it's already open. Maybe it's open for yesterday night. Yeah, here it is. Yes, you're right. Thank you. I think I left it open yesterday. OK, so the example one is gas dynamics and kinetic theory. So we are, in fact, coupling today the first two levels of the hierarchy. Fluid dynamics, Navier-Stokes factor, I should have put Euler picture, because it's idealized in dynamics, and Boltzmann, kinetic theory. So this will be a two-level multiscale application. And generally speaking, what we're thinking of is a situation where you have a compressible gas. And a compressible gas, a uh, typical phenomenon in a compressible fluid, in a compressible gas, is that you develop a density, con strong density constant and shock waves, things like this. Okay? And the question is, uh, how do I describe mathematically and computationally this phenomena, a phenomenon where the density can jump by here is just a factor two, but it can jump uh, by orders of magnitude. And as I said, the model will be uh, ideal gas dynamics for the fluid and kinetic theory for the shock region. 
Now, why do we have to couple these two levels? Well, because away from, take this case here, is a, a, a steep shock. Away from the shock region, region uh, actually you have little dissipation, if anything at all, which means that in this part of the fluid, you are safe if you apply uh, dissipationless hydrodynamics. However, you cannot apply dissipation hydrodynamics in the region where there are strong gradients. Um, for those of you who have been training kinetic theory, this is an obvious statement, but generally speaking, I think I will have to spend a few words to tell you why in a region like this, you cannot survive with uh, hydrodynamics, less so with ideal hydrodynamics. So we will need a tool to describe Higgs and Leon as means here are the lines. You know, here is where thing, the, the physics takes place, the difficult physics takes place. And it's, uh, it's a matter of fact that this, the width of the shock, delta, can be comparable with the size of the particle mean free path, which generally is uh, much smaller than any microscopic length in your problem. So mean free path could be of the order of, say, in air, I think is of the order of 30 nanometers. So if you have to do the calculation all over, and this could be a meter calculation, take an airplane, could be 20, 20 meters or so, and you cannot resolve scales of the order of the 100 nanometers. But if you don't resolve them, then you are likely to miss the important part, which is uh, where the fluid dissipates its energy. So we will try to put in place a machinery to combine uh, these two methods. So the macroscopic description <coughs> will be macroscopic, which, be, which means it is based on a mathematical model, including uh, the density of the fluid, the velocity and temperature, dot, 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 dot. Uh, this dot, dot, dot is uh, something very important and stands for the part of uh, non-equilibrium uh, um, the, the, the fields which describe the departure from local equilibrium. I will be mo much more specific in a moment. For now, accept that the equilibrium state of the fluid will be described, in fact, by these three variables only, which means that my, uh, the equation of ideal hydrodynamics will essentially a set of conservation equations like this. So it's a continuity equation. The time derivative of the density is driven by the, I just write in one dimension, but in three dimensions, this will be divergence and this will be a vector just to spare some notation. So <coughs> this is the continuity equation. Time derivative of the density driven by the divergence of the, of the, of the um, current. Time derivative of the current driven by the divergence. This will be a second order tensor, which is the momentum flux tensor. And <coughs> eventually, if you have thermal transport in your problem, you have the time derivative of the, of the momentum flux tensor, which will be driven by the divergence of the heat flux tensor. This object may have a rather complicated uh, structure, but in 1D, they are simple. They look like this. So the, the current density is nothing but the density times the fluid speed. The pressure, in 1D, it's a scalar, so it's the part which is related to the macroscopic kinetic energy of your object, plus the thermal part. So this is basically the pressure in an ideal gas proportional to density and temperature. And this is the mechanical motion, macroscopic motion and so on and so forth. If you go to the heat flux, you have contribution like this. The important thing to be noticed, there are several important things to be noticed. But the first is that I could go on forever with this list. And please notice that here is order one, order two, order three. So I can generate an infinity of these moment. These are called kinetic moments. Uh, but they all will depend on just five uh, in fact, I put a vector here, it's a bit inconsistent. In 3D, this is just a scalar. Please notice that all this quantity only depend on density, momentum, and temperature. And the reason is that uh, since we are talking ideal hydrodynamics, the only independent quantities, macroscopically, are those who are associated to the conservation principle of mass, momentum, and energy. That fixes the physics of your ideal fluids uh, completely. And it is not coincidental that on the right hand side of this equation, I find zero, which means that these are conservative equations. So there is no contribution whatsoever uh, by collision and dissipation. This is ideal hydrodynamics. 
And in a moment, we will track these ideological dynamics to uh, and the underlying kinetic theory, which I think is boring for my friend Bruce and for Jonas, for those who did kinetic theory. But in general, uh, I think uh, uh, people, uh, it's not completely clear uh, to a general audience why uh, uh, ideal hydrodynamics, how ideal hydrodynamics connects with kinetic theory. So, so much for that. So this will be the macroscopic model we have to solve on the, <coughs> on the computer. The microscopic model, small m, will essentially be associated with the uh, one body distribution function. This fx vt is the probability of finding a particle, a molecule, at position x and time t with a given velocity v. Okay? So please appreciate immediately that there is a wealth of additional information in this distribution function. This is only a scalar, but with an additional dimension. In fact, additional is three dimension, because this would be three uh, a vector and a vector and time. And uh, so in principle, this microscopic um, world contains way more information that you need uh, to compute your fluid. And we will see how to make use, good use of this information. Now, <coughs> the equation which describes uh, this distribution function is known as Boltzmann equation. And it can, uh, it can be pretty complicated if you spell out the details. But the, the structural uh, form of the Boltzmann equation is pretty simple. Uh, for free particles, so I, I assume that there is no external force. This is basically the streaming term. So this is how particles are transported along their own trajectory. So V is the molecular speed. So if I have some chunk, if I have a fluid like this, and I have particles with different speed, and I have a particle here, at time t, at time t plus delta t, the particle will be here, essentially. OK, so this is the free flight of uh, the particle on the assumption that there is no external force. This is called also streaming operator, OK? And once they uh, stream, so if I have a molecule here streaming like here, a molecule here streaming from here, once they meet, there is a certain interaction region. And in this interaction region, they collide. And that's where all the molecular detail come in. And this operator can be truly horrible if you insist on being realistic on the details of molecular collision. So the Boltzmann equation itself is a very tough equation to be solved, uh, not only because it's in six dimension plus time, but also because this in the operator is an integral differential operator, and so it's very intense. But fortunately, <coughs> for hydrodynamic purposes, we can, to a very large extent, forget about the molecular details and just retain the basic properties of this operator, which is conserve mass, momentum, and energy. Mass and momentum and energy conservation is somehow the DNA rule. The, the, the genetic of a fluid is just contained into these uh, three laws. And the detail of the molecular collision will, of course, fix the value of the transport coefficient, say, air versus helium, helium versus water, etc. Um, the structure of the macroscopic equation does not depend on the details of the Boltzmann collision operator, which is a great blessing. Otherwise, hydrodynamics would be very complicated. So we have to couple uh, these two sets of uh, equations. I is that clear to everybody what I'm saying? OK. If you have question as usual, you raise your hand. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a background for, as I said, for those who have not been uh, specifically trained in kinetic theory. Uh, also, because there are a few very general uh, notions which I think it, it would be good uh, to know. So let's consider now the Boltzmann equation and try to relate it to the hydrodynamic regime. <coughs> the first thing that you need to do is to understand whether there is a solution of this e equation, which, in fact, uh, annihilates the collision operator. The question you're asking is, suppose I'm totally steady, so I drop the time derivative. I am homogeneous. I drop the space derivative. And is there any distribution function such that the collision operator is annihilated too? In which case, I have a fixed point, if you want, of the Boltzmann equation. And yes, it turns out that there definitely is a solution of this problem, and a quite important one, in fact. And this is called the Maxwell, Boltzmann-Maxwell distribution function, which takes this shape. You can derive, in fact, this expression from 
the structure of the Boltzmann collision operator, but I spare you the exercise. You will take a lecture in itself. It's not very complicated, but still you have to go through a few calculations. But and there are a few general considerations to be made about this uh, uh, distribution function. So this is the fluid density, fine. And then you have the uh, Gaussian shape, OK? And this is the normalization factor. So this is the thermal speed, which uh, the square of the thermal speed is basically the temperature. And C is the so-called peculiar speed, which is the relative speed of the relative speed of the molecule versus the speed of the fluid. I don't know whether you can see this picture, but essentially the idea is the following: um, if, like in this room, if you are uh, counting, in fact, how many molecules are moving along a given direction v, uh, and you are standing in a room like this where basically the macroscopic flow is about zero, that doesn't mean that molecules are sitting idle. It only means that you have as many molecules moving rightwards as molecules moving leftwards. And they move pretty fast, in fact, because the typical speed, which is V-thermal, in this room is the order of the sound speed, so they move like little Ferraris, left and, uh, uh, and rightward. Okay? The point is that there are as many moving rightward as, uh, as moving leftward. But this uh, distribution is broad. Of course, if you are going to the North Pole, the distribution will be much more peaked. And if you are in a hot room, the distribution will be like that, both center about 0. But the shape will remain Maxwell. Okay? So this deformation will be described just by uh, making the temperature smaller or larger. The shape remains a Gaussian at equilibrium. That's a crucial notion. And if you're moving fast, uh, of course, if this is 0, you will have something like this or something like that. And this could be, in this, uh, yeah. if you're, say, in a car, this will be under, say, kilometer per hour or whatever. But again, neither the deformation, the fact of broadening or closing up the, the, the width of the, the distribution, Neither this nor the fact that you translate from velocity 0 to a given velocity, this is not at equilibrium. This is not changing the fact that you have a bell-shaped curve. So the molecule remains distributed according to a max value. Now you can do a little calculation, and I'm making a little logical jump. Please uh, accept it without too much of a proof. And the little jump is that if I now compute this object, which is the momentum flux tensor, a and B run over the Cartesian coordinates. So this will be x, y, z, x, y, z. If I now compute this object, the momentum flux tensor, using this distribution, what I get is precisely the convection term, macroscopic convection, plus the uh, temperature term, which is diagonal. There is no term associated to any gradient. And so this means that whenever the distribution function has the equilibrium shape, there cannot be any stress into the system. I'm not saying that I'm really proving that, not at all. But I'm just giving the argument. You go into any kinetic theory, you will find all the details. But the important thing is that this momentum flux tensor is the first kinetic moment which is supposed to know about the dissipation eventually. And as long as the distribution function is uh, equilibrium, it would just carry uh, information which doesn't in involve any gradient. This will not be true in general. If I compute this momentum flux tensor and I drop ACK here, I will have this piece plus some additional pieces. And this is a non-equilibrium. I try to depict this here. Suppose now I'm in a situation where, uh, in fact, I have some dissipation. What I would observe is that instead of a the black curve here, I don't know whether you can see it, this will be a Maxwellian. I will have some perturbation on top of that. Generally speaking, these perturbations are such that this expression is no longer valid. And that's what entails, in fact, this, the, the dissipation. I have to ask you for another, uh, I have to give another notion which I will not be able to demonstrate in full, is that if you replace this expression in the in, uh, into this equation, what you get are exactly the Euler equation on ideal hydrodynamics. 
Of course, I have to give many notions for granted, so I'm trying just to follow the logical path. So the important thing to be retained, the important notion to be retained is that uh, if the distribution function is a bell shaped like this, there cannot be any dissipation into the, into the problem. No stress. This is ideal hydrodynamics, and in fact, the Euler equation, the fluid equation, are, is in fact an Hamiltonian system. In V thermal, is V uh, thermal is kT over m is V thermal square. This is always true. In the case of the gas, this is also the sound speed square, which is the time derivative of the pressure versus density. But this, of course, only if the equation of state is uh, the equation of an ideal gas. This is generally true. Okay. So, why do you say the Euler equations are Hamiltonian? They are Hamiltonian because <coughs> um, because they have uh, you can write uh, an the you can derive that from an Hamiltonian because you don't have any dissipation. Oh, so the system is a perfect not is a, is. This one. These are conservative equations. So you can derive them from either a Lagrange or an Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian is the total energy of the system. But there is no collision here. There is no collision term. I mean. No, okay. there are collisions. That's the point. That's really the subtle point. Collisions are there. That's confusing, I know. There are collisions, but uh, collisions are such that this distribution function is realized in zero time. So they are basically instantaneous. I know that this can be confusing, but if you have no collisions, you cannot achieve the Maxwell distribution. You may have a Maxwell demon that Maxwellize the distribution. That would be enough to have that. It's a demon which is infinitely fast. If collision were infinitely fast, there would be no dissipation in this world. I know it looks counterintuitive, but it is like if you, if you want a fluid, you need badly need collisions. If molecules don't collide, you never have a fluid. You have a wild bunch of particles, each going on, on its way. A fluid means that there is collective motion, right? So particles have to collide a lot. But it is the time it takes the, the, the collision to take place which fixes the viscosity. And you see that, I can anticipate this slide. The viscosity of a gas is basically the thermal speed squared times <coughs> uh, LV times the collision time. So this is the time it takes for two particles, I mean, for a collision to uh, bring the distribution function to equilibrium. If it takes zero time, this goes to zero. So collisions are infinitely strong, infinitely fast. That is an ideal fluid. It's not a fluid with no, without collision. The system is always set to local equilibrium. The system is, is instantaneously local equilibrium. And I wonder, this is a question for Bruce, if there is I never saw in any test book any relation between the second principle and, and relativity. But really, I mean, yes, I mean, if uh, you, had, you could have an infinite uh, speed of propagation of interaction, you would have no, no dissipation. Um, this I leave it as, as a wild thought for you. But One thing that's slightly dangerous about that then is if you take solutions to the Navier-Stokes equations, and take the limit as viscosity goes to zero. You That's don't a single. Necessarily get yeah. solutions for the Euler equations because it's a very singular. It's limit. a singular limit. Yes. But certainly, if you take the equations of motion themselves, which is what I think you're doing, and and take that limit, the equations of motion one will formally go to the other, but the solutions don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. That the singular limit is dangerous, it's but. It's I think that's, I, I really don't want to co confuse the audience. I mean, this, this, this is a delicate matter. But I think the fact remains that one thinks of ideal hydrodynamics as a world where there are no collisions, right? And this is not true. I mean, the collisions are there, but they are infinitely fast. Otherwise, you don't have the fluid at all, OK? So that's, a, you could say, OK, what the has, what the, what is the connection between this consideration and multiscale? I think the connection is there because uh, you have to know uh, this basic notion in order to do a proper coupling uh, between the two worlds, kinetic theory and fluid dynamics. And here is basically the same argument, a little bit uh, more formalized. So suppose you write a collision operator as, let, let's consider this just as a frequency, a scalar. In general, it will be an operator. So the scalar, which acts upon 
the uh, departure of the equilibrium from uh, of the distribution function from the local equilibrium. And since is, this is a frequency, it's an inverse time, so this could be written f equilibrium minus f over tau. And there you see that when I send tau to 0, which is a singular limit, so uh, uh, if you want to do things properly from the mathematical point of view, you better be very careful. But the fact remains that when I send omega to infinity or tau to 0, tau is the time it takes for the collision, typical collision time, then you are forcing the distribution function into the equilibrium. Okay? So tau equals 0 means viscosity equals 0, although I mean, one has to be careful, but by and large, that's the way physics works. And so that means that ideal hydrodynamics is associated with infinitely fast relaxation. Okay? I don't want to comment on that. But uh, I still want to comment on one point that remember the structure I gave you. DTF plus VDXF e equal collision. So this is what Boltzmann called the ever-shifting battle. There is a clear competition between streaming, which is bringing matter out of equilibrium, and collision, which tries to pull it back to equilibrium. So it's a constant fight. You are in equilibrium here, right? I find my good environment. I sit, I'm sitting in this position, I'm perfectly happy. But then I stream. And they go to a different position where maybe the velocity and the temperature and the density are not the same I had before. So I have to readjust. And that's exactly what collisions are doing. And it takes some time to readjust. So the, the, competi the time scale of advection versus the time scale of collision will, in fact, dictate the physics of my problem. And if collisions always win because they are extremely fast, then you have ideal hydrodynamics. Is that clear to everybody? Because I think this is really a very general notion. Now, regardless of the mathematical subjects, which are very important, because these limits are never uh, regular ones, but this is a fact, uh, a general fact, which is a bit counterintuitive. So please always keep in mind this competition between moving and when you move, collision are just working to bring you back to the Maxwell. Well, omega. Omega, again, is, uh, is um, this hat means operator. So this is, um, uh, since the Boltzmann equation is a kind of nightmare, if you want to put all the details of collision interaction, uh, there is a very, do I have an eraser? No, behind the screen. Behind the screen. Okay. Ooh, there is a whole world here. Yeah. I have even colors. Great. So since the Boltzmann equation is really very difficult equation to work with, in general, you replace this collision operator with something simpler. And a very uh, effective and useful uh, um, simplification is to say the following. Since you know that equilibrium will annihilate this collision operator, the simplest form you can think of is this. Because by definition, when f is equal to equilibrium, this will be 0. And it is very sensible to assume that if you are not too far from this local equilibrium, this should even be a constant. Because this is the relaxation rate. So you replace collision with the relaxation. And this is a very, very wise way of doing. In principle, this should be omega v, v prime, a complex differential operator. But this uh, simplification, which is called Batnagar, Gross, and Crook, 1954, looks like a very rough way of handling the matter, but it's in fact much, uh, very, very important and very much more robust than, than people thought. And there is a nice book which I really recommend you, Vanier, which you probably know, in Statistical Mechanics. Even nowadays, we are fighting with people who write review papers saying that this is a poor approximation. It's, it is not. And if you go to Vanier book in 1960, he writes the relaxation approximation are much deeper than people think because they really capture the essence of relaxation to equilibrium as long as you're not too far from local equilibrium. So that's an approximation, but a very uh, sensible and, and uh, is physically sensible. It is mathematically extremely convenient. Very often, you can boil it down to a constant. And this constant will fix the viscosity. There will be a very complex functional in principle, see, and 
now it, everything is local in space and time, so you, you localize everything and then you expand to the first level. Yeah, but of course, I mean, you are cheating. And your maxwell demon comes back because you are assuming that you already know this. In, ma in, the f in many fluids, you know, in simple fluids, you know that this is Maxwellian. If you are in a liquid uh, or if you are in a more complex situation, I mean, you can always apply this approximation provided you know in advance what the local equilibrium is. Because you have to put it top down. And sometimes in doing that, the risk is, that, but I really don't want to make a lecture in kinetic theory, the risk is that you're losing the second principle by doing that. But I mean, that would be another, I really don't want to uh, take <coughs> um, so this. So the collision time enters in omega again, if you assume that omega is a constant? Yeah. Yeah. And this, actually, Tim, this is true if you're close to equilibrium. This is really true, because there is universality. Near equilibrium, I mean, the, as, as Walter Kohn put it, nature is short-sighted. So if this is your local equilibrium, you can come from the equilibrium with very strange trajectory. So this is F equilibrium, and this is F in kinetic space. But near to equilibrium, basically, you can replace the trajectory with a straight line. And the slope of the straight line is tau. Far away, you can go horribly wild. You don't know anymore. But sufficiently close, this is really reasonable. Uh, call it a collision time. I don't know. In general case, it's not proper. It's more a relaxation time. Because for general interactions, they wouldn't be the same thing. You know, only places in case you can. Uh, well, yes. In, in a dilute gas, this is a situation. You have a collision here. And then you travel a certain distance before you have the next one. So this is tau. But if the gas is not dilute, uh, you can have, this is just two-body collision. You can have more general situation. But I would say that tau is a typical interaction scale. OK, any question from, is that clear to everybody? Yeah, more, more or less just uh, another question that this frequency omega does not depend on how you modify this. Maybe if you change the, the tails of that distribution, maybe this relaxes more quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. In fact, I can tell you that changing omega is a very, very powerful recipe to go beyond near equilibrium uh, problems. That's a, pl a game which is played by us in turbulence, it's played by people in transport theory and semiconductors. Uh, in general, um, as I said, in principle, here you can put any local distribution, provided you make sure, before you, you write it down, that this reflects your physics. <coughs> so if you have a situation where the local equilibrium is not Maxwellian, then you should put this non-local equilibrium, if this is your question. So, and eventually, this might have tails. That can happen in plasma physics, for instance. Well, for reasons I mean, related to the Coulomb interaction. For what I'm discussing here, this is always a Maxwellian. But you're right. In principle, if you know your physics, and you know that your physics is such that you have a different local equilibrium, you are still entitled to use omega to describe the relaxation around that local equilibrium. Now, how far you can go with that will depend on the robustness of this equilibrium. In general, people open up this expression. And you, make it, you can make it dependent on temperature or on other state variables, because omega is sensing the environment. And that's a very powerful recipe, and uh, I think it's a way of going beyond, in fact, uh, uh, linear transport. Could be, it's a powerful paradigm to go really uh, strong on equilibrium, but I don't think there is a systematic theory. Maybe, Bruce, you can. I think Prigogine was trying to put down the principle mini maximum dissipation, but it's still in a situation where you are close to local equilibrium. I don't think we have any general principle far away from equilibrium. It's a big problem in non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So what's the thing about the Maxwellian distribution? Why don't we get an exponential decay or something like that? You mean, uh, what is spatial? Oh, yeah, uh, it's because uh, you, what, what do you mean by exponential, Tim? Oh, 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 because this is E minus beta. It's the Hamiltonian, so beta is one over temperature, and the Hamiltonian is the kinetic energy. So you have 
v squared because you have the, these are the, the quantities which are conserved in the microphysics. And the distribution, I mean, the, the, the Maxwellian is nothing but the canonical distribution, except that it, you can shift it. If you have a local speed, you can shift it. And very important, this speed can depend on space and time without ampering the collision operator. That's also, this is called local equilibrium. It turns out that this becomes a lecture in kinetic theory, but all the better so if this is useful. Please appreciate that this family of solution is a continuous family. I mean, there is nothing wrong in letting rho, u, and t change in space and time. That's what hydrodynamics is all about. And there is nothing wrong in sending this quantity to a constant, in which case you have equilibrium thermodynamics. OK? If these are constant, rho is a, is a homogeneous fluid, isothermal fluids, and u, is, if u is constant, you can just re, uh, make a Galilean transformation and put it at rest. This is equilibrium thermodynamics. But you still have the possibility of having this uh, uh, zero collision operator, even though these are changing in space and time. And that's exactly the transport phenomena which are described by hydrodynamics. And again, if collisions are fast enough, infinitely fast, no dissipation. Normally, they are, of course, finite. Uh, there is a finite relaxation rate, and this is what brings in dissipation. But they must be smooth on the scale of where Absolute. collisions are. Absolutely. 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 These variation is, is, these are order parameters, if you want. So basically, what you have, you have, you have your density, your velocity feel like this. And of course, the, the mean free path, which is the, the distance traveled by molecules before colliding, should be much smaller than that. There, should, there must be many, many collisions in a typical microscopic length, so that equilibrium has time to be established. And the separation of these scales is called Knudsen number, is the mean free path versus the typical macroscopic length, which is typically an inverse gradient, something like this. This is called Knudsen number, and if you want a fluid, Knudsen should be order 1 over 100 or so. Otherwise, again, you have a wild bunch of particles. You don't have a fluid. So in the fluid, the molecules are colliding a lot. They set up an order parameter, which is the local speed, for instance, and they stick to it. So again, you see that it's important that they interact. If they don't interact, you don't have any order parameter, and you have a free stream of particles, which is a completely different story which is, in fact, what I wrote down there. <coughs> the system never forgets, if you don't have collision, the system never forgets its initial condition. It's just completely out of equilibrium. So in the fluid, you have to lose memory because of collision. In this case, you never lose your memory. So it's a totally different uh, situation. The, the, and the two do not connect smoothly, by the way, which is what, which is what Bruce was pointing out. So it's an interesting story. And I think this paradigm competition between, uh, in fact, streaming, which is uh, free motion and interaction, you find it even in Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics. And it's really a general trend of uh, systems out of the uh, general feature of system out of equilibrium. Here it is encoded for a classical system, but I think it holds much more generally. So now that we have at least a very basic ground <coughs> to understand uh, what are the conceptual, at least, connection between uh, kinetic theory and hydrodynamics, we can uh, get a little bit more detail and try to go into the exercise. And let's try to set up, in fact, a, um, I think I better use directly this. <coughs> you remember last uh, Friday, we were using a two-track uh, for time, macroscopic time, and we said that uh, uh, we, the idea of multiscale is that we run the macroscopic solver as much as we can, but only now and then we have to go down to the microscopic solver in order to uh, correct the errors due to the fact that the macroscopic picture is not perfectly uh, reflecting the physics. In our case, if I'm not mistaken, the situation is like this. We would like to move the macroscopic solution from a given time, say, t1 to t2, and then do just a micro stitch, which is to say, take a just a one time step and 
or let, let, let's do like this. We have a microscopic representation, the distribution function at time t1. We project, and I will show you in a moment how, the microscopic state into the macroscopic state. And we move to the red track, which is macroscopic time. We advance the macroscopic solver as much as we can. So from t1 to t2, something like that. And t2 will be here. At this point, we realize that we need to describe, for instance, the shock structure. So what we do, we, since we have time uh, discrete time steps, so this will be delta t, the time step of the macroscopic solver. At time t2 minus delta t, we can reconstruct the microscopic state. So we go from macro to micro. And this is the reconstruction procedure. We advance the microscopic solver, typically in the shock region, because that's what we want to resolve. And once we have done our job, we go back to the macro trail. That's one part. I see that Jonas is scrutinizing this track, because this is similar to what you proposed. Now the, the two tracks go simultaneously. And what I show on Friday was a sequential cut. OK? So I have, make, I have to do a caveat. It, it is always very dangerous to present these things without having written the code, which uh, really uh, uh, implements them. But my disclaimer is that is, this is to convey you the philosophy. If you want to be serious, if you have to be serious, we should write an application. And then I very much encourage you to do that. Uh, it would not take long to write a simple 1D uh, gas dynamics plus kinetic theory. And maybe there are faults details which are not correct in this picture, but I'm pretty sure that the philosophy is correct. So the philosophy is run as much as we can on the macro, and every now and then, let's correct. For instance, suppose we have this, um, this shock propagation. Okay, What we may want to do, we have a shock here, and we don't resolve it with the microscope. Here. We may want to run the shock for a longer time, and then at some point decide that we need to resolve the structure. We don't need to resolve the structure at, at every single time step, only every now and then. And this takes some, of course, sensi sensibility on your problem. But that would be, for what we discussed last Friday, we understand that moving macroscopically from year to year, instead of doing all the time the microscopic calculation, would save us a lot of time. So we don't want to do that. We want to use the micro stitch only okay. surgically. So that's the, the, the strategy is, is pretty clear. So jump up and down from the two trails. And last Friday, we, we, I got a question. I don't know whether the question is still in the audience, how, how to do that. And today, I would like to be a bit more specific. I'm not saying that walking out of this lecture, you will be able to write the application, but almost, I think. What I'm showing you are all the basic ingredients we write a, to write a little code which implements that. So step number one, suppose we are given a certain distribution function. We want to bring it on the macro trail. So we have to generate the kinetic moment, macroscopic moment. And I don't think I need to twist your arm much to convince you that if I have the distribution function to generate the fluid density at a given point, all I have to do is to integrate in space. Because if I'm in a fluid position here, and I have all molecules with all possible speeds, by accumulating all the molecules, regardless of their velocity, what I generate is the amount of mass which I have per unit volume at a given point in time. And if I wait now with the molecular momentum, what I generate is the current, which is density time velocity. For a fluid at rest, this would be zero. Because I would have, as I said before, as many molecules moving right and as molecules moving left, in which case this integral would be zero. And <coughs> this, of course, th this should be a tensor, but I, I really don't mind at this point. And uh, if you want to generate the pressure, or better said, the momentum flux tensor, yeah, then you have to compute the uh, momentum of the molecule, so Fv. And this is the momentum flux. So how much momentum along the direction x is flowing in direction y? That's why this is a second order tensor. And you can go on. For instance, heat flux is basically related to a triple momentum. And 
typically flux will be this will be a V square, so the kinetic energy, how much kinetic energy is transported along x, y, z. So heat is a third order kinetic moment. Um, <coughs> momentum flux, which is where dissipation comes in, is second order. And zero first order are typically uh, conserved quantities. But from a formal point of view, all we have to do is just to project. So we work in phase space, x and y. And to go from microscopic state to the macroscopic state, basically what you have to do is integrate along velocity space with relatively simple weight function. So that's an easy procedure. It can be costly though on a computer. So in order to do this efficiently, you, there is a lot of, uh, there is a wide of, uh, I mean, you have to decide which method you use to solve, the, uh, to uh, represent your distribution function along V, but that's another story. Conceptually, it's very straightforward. Next step, remember, Mach revolve. Here is just to give you an example. This is one possible way of uh, evolving the Euler equation. Of course, we would have an other equation for j and for t, but this is just to give you the idea. So if n labels time, this could be a simple time stepper. And j labels space, n labels time. So this would be d rho dt plus dx, the, the space derivative of the current. So it could be something like that. Uh, and that's standard matter. Uh, so that means that you move many of these steps, and you, by moving a certain number of these steps, you walk along, tuck, 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 okay, like that. And the microsolver is sitting idle at that point. It's just sleeping. How far you can go, there is no res general recipe, I think. That really depends on the knowledge, pre-knowledge on your problem. So, so far, this is just standard numerical uh, integration. Now comes the point which is key, and I hope it will be clear enough. Now that we have walked a certain number of time steps, we have to do the inverse operation. So going from f, from macro, to the kinetic moments m, which is rho, u, p, blah, 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 this is easy. This is integral. How do we go back? Now we have to reconstruct the microscopic system. And this is an inverse problem. And as all inverse problems, there is no exact way of reconstructing, because by going from year to year, you have destroyed information. And you cannot reconstruct this information exactly, unless you are a wizard. You can do optimal reconstruction. There is a lot of theory in control, I think, uh, system control theory. But you find the be best optimal reconstruction, but not an exact so, and we will see that here again, there are several possible situations. Now, the simplest thing, the simplest situation is like follows. So this is the grid where we integrate the macro solver. So this is space, okay? So this is a macro cell, j minus one, j, j plus one. Suppose now my shock is basically in this region, okay? I have a density profile and the density takes a sudden jump in this region. It could be several cells, but typically one cell in the microscopic is enough. And suppose that here I, just, just symbolic, I have a finer grade when I want to evolve my distribution function. Okay? And of course, I did not represent it as a velocity dimension. It's just like having extra dimensions. Like, okay? So kinetic space is, in fact, extra dimensional space. So, so I don't represent the velocity degrees of freedom. Just think of a grid to host my particles. And again, the particles might be sitting on the grid. They might be grid-free. That's, again, plenty of choice. But let's keep uh, the, the situation general. So what I, w one possible thing I can do is the following. I have my row. I have row u and whatever I need, row u and t, I have available from the macro solver here, here, and here. So I can take an easy interpolation to the half and get the density, the fluid speed, and the temperature at an intermediate point. Then I have to sample, which means that I could say, fine, in the, the my microscopic state will just be the local max value at that given point. And I know what the local max value is, because I just, this is Maxwell. So this is exactly the distribution function I was showing you before. So once I have rho, u, and t, there is nothing more I need to know about the distribution of the particle in kinetic space, because I'm making the assumption that I am at equilibrium. 
So at this point, if I do this, make this assumption, all I have to do is to sample from a Gauss distribution, which is really a simple exercise. You just call a routine library, yeah? GRAND, I guess it's called, random Gaussian, and that's it. So you would have, in fact, the initial state, the initial condition for your kinetic solver. Then you have to solve the kinetic equation. But in this way, you generate the initial and, uh, in fact, bounded initial condition, actually, on the fine grid. And on that fine grid, then you can run the kinetic solver. I would like to, be, uh, to ask you, what is the danger of such a simple assumption? Well, it is a big mistake if you are greedy. If you are not greedy, it could be work perfectly fine. Suppose that this is my microscopic problem and I have the shock here. Okay, so this is the region where I put the microsolver. Okay. If I'm staying away from the shock, take my micro region from here to here, this assumption would be fine because I'm sufficiently far away so that uh, I'm at local equilibrium because basically I have no gradients. But the price to pay is that I have to run the microsolver on in a larger region, space region. Okay? So it's a matter of compromise. If I want to save on computing time, I would try to put the micro stitch just tightly close to the shock. And in that case, I mean, it might be that I start to feel some gradient. And if I have a gradient, I have a dissipation, and my distribution is no longer Maxwellian. So it's a matter of balance. I mean, if I want to save a lot of computing time, then I try to get closer and closer to the, to the shock. But if I do so, such simple sampling procedure might fail. Is that clear? Because I have no gradients. Because the Reynolds number is high? No, 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 no. That's nothing to do with the Reynolds number. It's because dissipation is generally given by viscosity, some Laplace u, and and also it's related to the gradient. I mean, this is momentum. If if uh, you are in a situation where the macroscopic quantity are flat, you are basically at a thermodynamic equilibrium. So you don't have dissipation. Yeah. That the microsolver would create. For the micro. Yeah. yeah, that's one possibility, yes. Because otherwise, you lose all the gradient part of the. Yeah. Yeah. You lose uh, this part. But there has to be something more than just the equilibrium, otherwise, why would the microscopic uh, solver take you through that transition? No, I mean, this transition is in the microphysics, I agree. But. Nevertheless, I mean, uh, since the transition is sharp, uh, the region where you have to take into account this non-equilibrium is very confined. Well, but I'm saying, where do you start? Here. Yes. There should be something, at least a little bit more, away from equilibrium, because it's exploring the equilibrium, and that's how you start. Oh, no. Why would the micro evolution take you through a step? But it's a local equilibrium. It's not a global equilibrium. No, 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 no. But the theme is right. I mean, it's clear that this problem at no place can be perfectly in thermodynamic equilibrium. But the problem is that non-equilibrium is very sneaky. It takes place, I mean, it develops violently on a very small region of space. Okay? So even though literally it's never zero, but the non-equilibrium distribution, if you make a statistical sampling of the molecules here, you will find they are basically Maxwellian. And if you do it here, they will not be Maxwellian. Violently, violently so. And what I said before, if you know beforehand that your distribution is Maxwellian, why would you solve a kinetic equation? You know that it is Maxwellian. Okay? So, whereas here you don't. Here, I mean, the microscopic solver has nothing to tell you. I mean, it's totally at, at a loss. So, where do you move? I, I don't know. I mean, as I said, depend on your problem. But I know for sure that if you, the farther you move from the shock, the better you are uh, in terms of being close to equilibrium. So in fact, you should have an adaptive method, which is in fact tracking the shock and, and doing adaptive calculation around the shock.
Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, I think in the very beginning, I mean, it's an art. I mean, you have to know your physics. So I don't think there is a general recipe. You have, in fact, when you do multi scale comp computation, an important part which I will not cover is how, which kind of uh, uh, mm, sensor you develop on your microscopic solver to understand that it is time. I mean, the, the, the picture, it's time to go back to the, to the micro. I mean, it's really a matter of being a wizard. It's easy for me to plot such a graph, but now you run your application. When, it, when do you decide that it's time to go to the micro? You have to develop sensors, antennas, on your macro solver in order to say, hey, something is going on. And I think this is possibly the most difficult part. Yes, please. And then Bruce. You have a question? Yeah, uh, so, but that's a stick picture applied to the shock wave problem because there I have the impression you should always use the microscopic uh, simulation for the shock wave region because won't this microscopic simulation completely I mean, do some some harm to the shock wave? Not not necessarily so, not necessarily. I think, but again it's something one has to do. I think if you, if you start with a situation like this where you just don't resolve and say you move it in time only with the microscopic, I'm not so sure that and then every now and then you, you decide to resolve because maybe at some point the shock comes to a position where there are chemical reactions for instance, where you really need the detailed structure. Then you are guaranteed that you have to open up. But I'm not so sure that you need to bring the shock all over with you at each and every single time step. But again, this is really problem dependent. I cannot go to that level. I mean, I, it, it, that's really, if you come here and say, okay, now I have this shock problem, let's look at it and see what the physics is, then you will decide. I'm not convinced that uh, you have to carry over the detailed structure of the shock. It's a little bit what we said on Friday, the, the idea that the chimera method, that you, uh, unveil your identity only when you're close to the critical region. We were talking a polymer, right? The polymer can be anonymous here and then it get close to the catalytic uh, surface, then he has to unveil his chemical identity. Here is a little bit the same, I guess. The sense that you don't need to resolve the structure of the, of the shock unless there is some specific physics where, which would be badly missed unless you resolve the shock. But this said, I cannot tell you in general that how, how frequently you have to open up the structure of the shock. I don't know. Actually. But I know for sure that if you have to carry along, carrying along the shock all the time, it's a possibility. But at that point, you are cashing much less on, on, uh, on the, your, your multiscale. But if your physics is such that you need to carry it over all the time, then you have to do it. Uh, so Bruce had a question. Uh, in fact, it was essentially the same question that was asked. It seemed to me that once the shock forms, if the shock is moving, you'll never be able to stop using the microsolver. But that seems like that's the same question. Well, I, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, not sure. But if I have a two shock collision, I think in astrophysics there are plenty of this situation. I don't think you need to, I mean, you just would carry these waves along until they get very close before you open up the, the shock. Isn't that right? You're saying the hydrodynamics. Yeah, I mean, you hide the shock in the bag. You, know, you carry the bag and on long steps, and then you open it up. But I'm not sure you can do it uh, without spoiling it. No, no, it's not obvious. No, it's not obvious. Uh, yeah, but they... No, no, it is not obvious. I totally agree. The Newton number could be large at the shock. The Newton number is, is one. But, but normally they don't grow. Why would, why would they grow? But I accept. You keep reinitializing your density with this equilibrium condition. You may develop a systematic error that you have no control. Guys, I told you. 
more probably. I told you, no general recipe. And that's, we are already into the, I like that. You are already thinking in terms of <laughs> doing the application. And all I, the best I can do just to give general ideas, but I agree. I mean, that's, that's really all open to uh, detailed implementation. OK, so it's time for a break. I think you don't need to carry the shock along all the time. And suppose you have two shock collisions. Why would they? I don't think you would pollute the, the, the profile until they come really close. I think, yeah, so let's go on with uh, how do we do the sampling part, which is, I think, the most specific one of this. Uh, coupling between kinetic theory and, and uh, macroscopic dynamics. I think we have said it all. So there is nothing new in this slide except, yeah, I mean, that's the way you would do it. Uh, the simple, uh, if, the, if the molecules, the kinetic theory, the molecules are grid-free, you just sample the velocity out of the macroscopic velocity, which you know, and you just draw a random number from z between 0 and 1 from a Gaussian distribution, that's it. On the other end, if you want to put your molecules in a grid space, in, in velocity space, that possibly you have to locate your uh, random velocity. In a regular grid, you would just do the nearest integer, and you would be sitting on, on a grid in velocity space. I mean, this is really almost coding detail, but just to tell you that in the end, as long as you can sample from the uh, Maxwellian, it's really very simple matter to, um, to implement it. Now, the difficult part is, when you don't sample from the Maxwellian. And I think, again, there is not a unique recipe. One possibility is the following. It's just one possibility. Uh, so how do we do non-equilibrium sampling? OK, so sampling from the Maxwellian is just is trivial. It's just sampling the canonical distribution in three dimensions, which is a piece of cake. Now, one possibility, this is entirely new, it's non-equilibrium. So uh, I mean, entirely new. It's not a situation that you find ordinary in, in, in the statistical mechanics. Now, let's take DFDT is just the total time derivative, the, the streaming operator. Okay, it's just a short one. And let's do what I said before. Just replace the uh, complicated collision operator with a relaxation form. And I would say for our purposes, we can really assume that tau is a constant. It's a typical collision time. And this is Maxwell. Now, what we could do if we decide that no, my equilibrium is not enough, we should build up the next order correction to equilibrium. And that's easy, at least formally it's easy. That take this equation and just one line of rearrangement shows you that the distribution at time t formally is given by this propagator, is the inverse operator, as applied to the local equilibrium. Then on the assumption that this uh, tau times the streaming, which is uh, what I said before, it's the competition between collision and streaming. If this is sufficiently small, and this is a very delicate point near shock, you would expand the propagator. This is last like 1 over 1 plus something. And this expansion to next order would give you something like that, which is tau as applied to the stream equilibrium. Okay? This is weak non-equilibrium because I've just expanded the green function to first order. Hope you are with me. This is just, it's just symbolic, so it's very, it's very simple uh, to be uh, formally to written down. And now <coughs> the task is easy because if I apply the time derivative, this is total time, so I should, in fact, for the clarity, ddt is ddt plus Vdx, OK? So that means that I have to take time and space derivative of the equilibrium. But this is easy, because the equilibrium, as I showed you, only depends on rho, u, and t. So these are basically a streaming operator as applied to a field which I know from the macroscopic solution. Just to say that I know I can build, in fact, the next correction, next non-equilibrium correction to the local Maxwellian and actually sample from this. But you immediately realize that this is co certainly more complicated because these quantities involve space and time derivatives, so I have to interpolate in the macroscopic grid because what I need are basically the gradients in space and even time. So that's more complicated matter. But I think the philosophical point should be quite transparent. 
there are many, many questions you may ask about this. Uh, and I would say the most, pro the deepest one is, how do you know that you can stop here given the fact that near a shock, this quantity is basically one? That was Bruce's point. This is the Knudsen number. This is, in fact, collisional time versus advection time, advection time somehow. And this quantity near a, a shock is basically one. So this cannot be exact. There is no exact recipe, but it's a way of going. Can, can, can't you skip the time derivative by using the transform equation? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Of course, but this is a kind of technical. Because you circled them red. No, I circled them red because. But then you see that it's a three transform equation. Yeah, I circled them red because my point is that careful, this implies non-local information. That's all I want to know. But I agree. In general, the structure of this equation is such that time derivative can always be disposed in favor of space derivative. But that's, I mean, you know it because you did it, uh, you, you, you are familiar with kinetic theory. And to show that, it would take some time. The only point I want to make, and now we are in a situation which is much less standard. It's a difficult situation because we have to sample from a distribution which in the first place cannot be strictly speaking exact. Second, and most importantly, I've not pointed out it here, but I think this is still really open field. Sampling from this distribution is, is open. By the time I do this operation, I've no longer guaranteed that F would be positive. Just do the little exercise and you see that there are restriction on tau and restriction actually on, on on the time derivative in order for f to be positive. So sometimes, if you are strongly off equilibrium, the f you build this way might be negative at certain regions. And I see so the paper of the professionals. Normally, if you, uh, if you are uh, sitting in a negative part of the distribution function, you just reject the move. But that's an error. I mean, it cannot be exact. I don't know any exact procedure to do this sampling. Uh, but the expert in this field, uh, I think uh, the world expert, is Alejandro Garcia. So if you trace his literature, he has a number of beautiful papers. I think he's in Santa Barbara, in California. San Jose State. He's really Monte Carlo man. But in principle, let's forget about all these subtle issues which are key, nonetheless, to success of your application. I only want to bring you the attention on the fact that really you are changing, you are in a different world, and it's almost terra incognita. It's not standard sampling from a positive distribution function. So what, what you would do, what we might do as a practical exercise, you can build this, okay, just taking your in derivative, then at this point you have an F, and then you do the standard Monte Carlo reject. So you draw a random number for the distribution function and random number for the velocity. And if the random F falls below your F, you accept. Otherwise, yes, no. Otherwise, you reject. So that's the standard. And if you reject, you try it again. But this is not an exact procedure. It is more laborious because you have to build this. It's not granted that this is enough. And third, it generally, if it is enough, you, if it, when it is not enough, you will be, in fact, re reminded by the fact that f goes negative. Generally, f negative means that this expansion is not, not enough. It's short legs doesn't capture the, the, um, uh, the, the shock structure. But it's a way of doing. It's a practical way of doing. That's a, a recipe. Okay? And that's what people do, in fact. There is another possibility, which is, Similar, although I, I cannot tell you, I, I, you don't know unless you do it, I cannot tell you which one is best. I think, people, they, they, based on the literature, I think this is one is favorite. But there are not many papers around, by the way. I'm just talking two or th a few papers. Another possibility, this looks a little bit ugly, but it, in fact, it is simple. Forget about grad, but you can always write, uh, write an, uh, the distribution function as a Maxwellian piece plus a list of kinetic moments. And of course, the first five would be the equilibrium part. So rho, u, x, y, z, and t. And of course, next in the tower of kinetic moments, you have the quantities which would eventually fill non-equilibrium. Okay, Momentum flux, it, and you could go on. But normally, going on doesn't really buy much. So that means that if you get 
the non-conserved quantities of momentum flux and heat transfer from a tentative constitutive relation, you can use this uh, tentative distribution function to initialize the macroscopic solver. Then you would run it and correct for the constitutive relation. You, you see what I mean? So, in other words, I have rho u and t on the macro grid. I can, based on the gradients of this quantity, I, and based on a constitutive relation, constitutive relation means that the heat flux is some constant, some conductivity times the gradient of the temperature, which I can estimate from the macroscopic solver. I can tentatively, only tentatively, use, a, say, conductivity to build up an expression for Q, put this Q here, and sample from there. The sampling will only build the initial condition for my kinetic solver. The kinetic solver will solve and eventually restitute a refined expression for the non-equilibrium model. Okay? But in this case, you have to close the hierarchy by using constitutive equation. Otherwise, you have no, 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 no. I mean, you use a constitutive equation only to initialize the kinetic solver. But in fact, you would replace the constitutive relation with the, the information provided by the kinetic solver. Yeah, so you, you close the hierarchy. Uh, you close the hierarchy. You have no way to know. You have to close it. Right? So in other words, that's another possibility. Uh, well, just again to tutorially, what does it mean? If I sample from a from a Maxwellian distribution at zero speed, in fact, I have you know the Monte Carlo. You throw the uh, the stones in the pond, and if the stone falls within the area, that's a way of measuring. Uh, then you accept the move, and if it falls outside, you reject. So this, the sampling from a, a low, um, sorry, a zero speed Maxwellian would be just throwing stones in this pond, in the yellow pond. If you are still at equilibrium, but you're moving, then these spheres would, uh, shifted, would be shifted and centered about the non-zero local uh, speed of the fluid. And when you are in non-equilibrium, basically you have shear. So you have variation, say, of the uh, longitudinal velocity against the cross coordinate and this is just like deforming the, the, the cycle into an ellipsis with a, a, an orientation which depends on the, on the shear. And these are your stones. So the Monte Carlo would be again at accept and reject. And there again, of course, the physics can change. This quantity, which in the specific literature is called grad 13 moment distribution because these are 13 moments if you count them. Uh, again, you have no guarantee that this is positive definite. So this lack of positive definiteness is a general problem that you have to face when you sample from non-equilibrium distributions. And I'm afraid there is no, you can back me up, I don't think there is any you know, exact solution to the problem, not that I know and not that I've seen in the literature. But again, it's a perfectly well-defined procedure to go about and and do the job. So I think this is the most, uh, in fact, uh, how would I say, most characterizing feature of the multi-scale coupling between uh, fluid dynamics and, and, and kinetic theory. Now, uh, regarding the micro solver, of course, here could be a series of lectures on its own. It could be Monte Carlo, Lattes, Boltzmann. Uh, there are a whole list of methods, and I'm certainly not entering this issue here, so I don't know what I should comment about this, probably nothing. Let me see. Uh, but what I want to comment about is, I, I think this is getting detailed, but I'm sorry, but I think at some point we have to do it. The important thing is that, uh, and again it's general, is that the micro, the macro solver has to provide the, the initial and boundary conditions to, to the micro solver. That's crucial. So let me try to see if I can spell out this example. Suppose this is again the region where I put my zoom, where my shock is, okay? And I have some structure of velocity space. I will not be specific, so I have a grid where I put my particles. The particle could be sitting in a grid both in, in uh, uh, real space and, and momentum space, or they could be free momentum space. I, I don't want to specify that. But what could a possible boundary condition, what would a possible boundary condition look like? Consider this like a sort of micro, this is a micro region where you have inlet flow from the macro solver and you have an outlet, and you have to have an outlet condition. Like if this 
suppose this is a kind of micro pipe. In, an, in, a, in a fluid dynamic problems, one possible boundary condition is to specify uh, uh, the mass flow in the inlet and, uh, say, the pressure of the density at the outlet. So you can do the same in a, in a sort of micro environment. And that's rather interesting. So suppose this uh, green arrow is the uh, flux, the mass flux J, which I get from the macro solvent. And the green uh, ball is, uh, say, the macro density I get from the macro solvent at this point. Okay. Eventually, I will need an interpolation in going to uh, j plus one and a half, but this is the detail. What do I do with this information? That's interesting, I guess. Um, let me try to spell it out. So we are sitting at j minus one and a half, and uh, please appreciate that the m momentum flux, sorry, the mass flux at this point is just the sum of two integrals which I think is written there, but I want to repeat it on the black. You might remember that the definition of J, I don't know whether you can read it. No, it doesn't. Yeah, because this erasure is not. Oh, okay. oh, great. Great facility. So you might remember the definition j at point x and time t is f of x v t v d v, which means I can split this integral into part v greater v less than zero plus v. Okay, so this would be this part would be the uh, molecules which are leaving which would move in uh, westwards. And at this given point, you have molecules moving left and mo molecules moving right. Now, the molecules moving right, you know from your kinetic solver, OK? Because this molecule comes from the kinetic region. So once you run the kinetic solver, this information is available. It's, it's what I call j minus. It's just this integral. But the total J, which I get from the macro, is the sum of the two. So this I get as a boundary condition from the macro, the total J. This I can compute from the kinetic solver. So that means that I can compute the part which is entering. I have to fix the boundary condition for the particles, the molecules which, which enter the macroscopic domain. Okay. So that means that I know, in fact, the amount of current of the, or amount of uh, flux which is entering the macroscopic domain just using the boundary condition, computing this integral, so I can sample, in fact, from a half Maxwellian and draw this molecule out of this condition. Is that clear? So it's basically, uh, let me see, I think I have another picture which might be clearer than this. Yeah, I hope this is clear. So this is a constraint. The, the total mass flux at the grid point J minus 1 and half, I, I'm sorry, this is confusing. This is this, this capital J, and this is the grid point small j minus 1 and half. Sorry for the confusion in the notation. So this is a sum of a left moving kinetic flux plus a right moving kinetic flux, OK? So the, the left moving is the integral on the half distribution, only particles which are moving left. But this, I know, because they come from inside. This is a constraint, so I can, by subtracting, know how much momentum flux should be carried by the particle which I plug into the, into the macroscopic region. So all I have to do is to sample a distribution, be it Maxwellian or non-equilibrium, half distribution, in fact, because it will be only the positive velocity. Okay, and so that that would make for the inlet boundary condition. The outlet, if you assume that the outlet is just uh, fixing the macro density, it's easy because if I have a particle going away, uh, moving along the right uh, world direction, all I have to do is to inject another particle with a positive speed. Drawn via local Maxwellian with this density. Yes? So the inlet, do you do, is it an iterative process where you take, um, do the micro go back to 
that is an iterated process if you want to be bold and restitute to the macro solver an updated J. Which means that you don't accept this as a fixed constraint, but eventually you refine this value as well. So that's really depend on your purpose and strategy. You could accept this as a fixed constraint in time and use this machinery just to resolve your shock. But don't touch the value of the flux here and there. Eventually, if you want to feed back on them, then it becomes iterative. Because you don't know the blue. No, no, the blue you know because once, once, uh, um, no, the blue you know because first of all you can, at, at time, at the initial time you can, by interpolation, you know all the information, and then you run it. So the blue comes from the from the inside, so you know it. What you don't know is the the part of flux. Kinetic flux, so this is kinetic flux. Whenever I have the integral in V, it's a kinetic flux. The part which I don't know is the V, the integral with uh, V positive, which is the particle moving this way, at this point, because they would come from here, and I don't have them. So that's the boundary condition I have to reconstruct. But I can be even more specific. <laughs> that's <laughs> maybe too much, but I think nonetheless it should be relatively clear. Now I'm slicing in time, OK? And suppose that the macro, the macro solver is just two time steps. Okay? Delta capital T is the time step of the macro solver. And the micro, the kinetic, will be just half of it. Now, how would the procedure work? So I will, uh, so this is the, the red, uh, the points where I have information available from the macroscopic solver. And I can always construct the micro, which is the blue bullet, out of interpolation plus sampling. Okay? So this will be time t, which is the initial time from the microscopic solver. So I can get all of this information just by interpolation and sampling and time t. Agree? Fine. Then I have to move this information in time. I will have particle which from here go there, particle that from here go there. And what I need is the information of the distribution function for the particles which enter the domain. How do I do that? Well, in the first place, I need to interpolate even in time. Now you see why I need interpolation in time. Because the microsolver will have uh, time steps which uh, have not been, uh, which are smaller than the time step I've been using in the microsolver. So this information is not available from the microsolver. I interpolate here to there, I get this, and then I do the sampling as I was discussing before. So you see, it's elaborate, but nonetheless, the conceptual scheme should be relatively clear. Once I have these boundary conditions and I have this initial condition, any kinetic solver would, would fill up all the information on the time level which I need. And I can do as many as I want until I decide that it's time to go back to the macroscopic solver, which here happens at just at 2 delta t. And then I can restitute all the moments I want, including the higher order ones. So if from this picture, it should be clear that you need initial condition all over, interpolation in space plus sampling. But you also need interpolation in time, because at each time slice of the microsolver, you need a boundary condition. So these schemes always imply space and time interpolation. And you all know that this is delicate, because if you have an accurate scheme, interpolation can spoil the accuracy, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, that's, but conceptually, that's. That's what you, what you would be doing. I would say conceptually is, uh, is relatively simple. So I think I exposed you to the uh, general procedure. And I think we also highlighted what the traps, the ca possible catches behind it are. I think the most serious one is sampling from negative distribution function. Although if you look at the literature, which is very <laughs> small, just a few papers, that they don't seem to report this as a, a terrible problem, so maybe it's, uh, in practice is not as uh, bad as one may fear just based on the theory. So that's, I would say, all what one needs to build up, in fact, uh, an application. And I think, as I was saying to one of your colleagues, if any of you is interested, I think the only way to absorb these things, including myself, is uh, try to do an exercise. Try to solve a 1D problem like this and see what happens. So if any of you is willing to do that, we could interact remotely. And next time we come, 
we can discuss. That would be really a way of absorbing the technique and, and eventually going in, into the details which cannot be sorted out by this general uh, framework. But I think the general framework is nonetheless, uh, I would say, rather complete. I don't think there are any additional uh, qualitative features which need to be exposed. Now, this is just to remind you that uh, we never cover really the details on how we solve, in fact, the kinetic equation here. And this is an entire new world. And well, just, to, just for, for the sake of completeness, uh, the most important, the most general method is the direct simulation Monte Carlo, where the molecules are grid free in, in velocity space and, 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 and uh, configuration space is a stochastic technique and can take any nonsense. So this is the most general. That's, that's really the workhorse of uh, rarefied gas dynamics, either in you know, shuttle re-entry or, or, or micro devices. And this goes back to Graham Bird, sometimes called Bird's method. And it dates to the 60s, but has been evolving. And it's still, I think, the most popular, the most powerful way of solving for rarefied gas. But Pardon? What does the Direct simulation Monte Carlo. And uh, strange enough, in some book, or many books of Monte Carlo in, in statistical physics, take, I don't know, Binder and Landau, Monte Carlo is usually associated with equilibrium Monte Carlo in high dimensional space, or quantum Monte Carlo, kinetic Monte Carlo. The SMC uh, seems to be living in, uh, on a world of its own. It's basically used by, I would say, mm, basically aeronautical engineers. And, but in the recent years, uh, also in, in, um, since they are rarefied gases in micro devices are very important, I think the, the nano engineering community is also picking up. On it. If you have a rarefied gas far from equilibrium, there is no way, I mean, that's the only way, method you can use. But here you take into account the details of the collision operator, so this is expensive. And so people, uh, whenever the details are not important, people try to, do, to get away with the complexity of the collision operator. And there are many possible techniques. And our favorite one is the lattice Boltzmann, but it's really no point for me to discuss this technique here, except for saying that uh, very often it is convenient to put, in fact, the velocity space, um, which is a three-dimensional continuous space, very often, if you are not too far from equilibrium, you can reduce the velocities to a small set line in a crystal like this. And this method, in fact, again, as long as you are not too far from local equilibrium, is very, very efficient. And that's what uh, I will present a little bit of it tomorrow. That's the method we use for the biopolymer translocation. So it's very powerful, but uh, I mean, if you are really very far from equilibrium, that's not obvious that the physics is correctly reproduced. But it has been used to far from equilibrium. Uh, by us. <laughs> and we were heavily criticized for that. Uh, so what's the justification for that? Hmm. That's a very, that's a very how fast. Far how far? Yes. No, no, uh, th that's really, a, a, I would say, it's a modern front of Lattice Boltzmann is, um, Lattice Boltzmann was invented to solve Navier-Stokes equations, so fluid problems where the equilibrium is weak. And some people wrote, in fact, very categorically, cannot be used other than that. And then, of course, we like to challenge this kind of statement. We use for microfluidics and up to Knudsen. Knudsen is this guy. This is another form of Knudsen number. So this should be much less than 1 in either dynamic. It should be 10 minus 2. And we run it up to 10 to minus 1 for microflows. And it's still good. Uh, but ta when this gets really one, then uh, you make a mistake, at least in microflows, which is of the order of uh, almost 50, 60%. So it's quantitatively wrong, qualitatively correct. <laughs> Up to the, when this quantity is of order one, point 0.1, it's still OK. So it looks like the lattice Boltzmann has some memory of this kinetic theory nature, although you cannot go as far as saying, oh, it's just like solving Boltzmann. That would be really a crime. Knudsen one we cannot do. So I think for a shock, uh, well, there are Boltzmann, lattice Boltzmann scheme for shocks, but they are a, a separate family. So as far as this audience is concerned, my message, plain, plain message would be, there are ways of solving kinetic equation in this relaxation form, which on the assumption that you are not too widely out of equilibrium are orders of magnitude faster than the SMC. 
When I say orders, I mean orders. Three orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude. Okay? So one should try to use it as much as you, as you can with the caveat that, in principle, you can go to Kunsten 1. Okay? And there are other methods like this. So I could give a crash course on the direct simulation of Monte Carlo, but I'm not sure that this is the idea. But just to convey you the feeling. I mean, that's, it's, it's, I think, a tool that any computational physics should, physicist should have at least in, in his mind. So just very briefly, how much time do we have? Five minutes, right? Yeah. OK. Uh, let, I don't remember what uh, I think I'm almost done. So I can save the five minutes for the explanation of the car. So essentially, this is a tool that you would use whenever you need to take into account the details of the collision. And so the details of the collision is basically, so if you have two molecules, so a collision will be one and two get in touch in a sphere of uh, size s. And they would emerge from the collision with velocity two prime and one prime. So uh, the mechanics of the collision is pretty simple. It's just two-body collision. So the crucial quantity is the relative speed. And the relative speed is a vector whose magnitude doesn't change in the collision because velocity, the, sorry, energy is conserved. So all, all uh, the information on the collision is uh, in fact conveyed on the angle. Omega is the angle between this and this. So this is the true. Boltzmann collision operator, which involves the, the relative velocity, involves the so-called cross-section, which is, in fact, you may think of the cross-section as the effective size of a molecule seen by the other molecules as a result of the interatomic potential. It's a statistical uh, transcription of the uh, uh, atomic potential, and this is cross section are typical of scattering processes in quantum mechanics, nuclear physics, or whatever. So basically, the Boltzmann equation is a nightmare because it implies an integration of this object, which can be pretty complicated. In fact, in many cases, you cannot derive this analytically from the potential. Only for very for our sphere, you can. For very specific potential, you can. But generally, you don't have uh, an analytical expression given the interatomic potential, the cross section. And even if you add, you still have to perform an integral in 3 plus 3. So this is a six-dimensional integral. And you have to do it every single space uh, grid. So this is not a nice object to live with. And you generally don't put that on a grid, because a six-dimensional integration is too much for a grid method. That's why you use Monte Carlo. The rule of the thumb is that you use Monte Carlo in more than three dimensions. You don't go for a, a numeric. Just think of this as, as an integral. Integrals in more than 3D are not uh, recommended that you use grid uh, uh, like Gaussian quadrature or Simpson or whatever. You go to Monte Carlo. So the name Monte Carlo comes from this. Direct simulation comes from the fact that you directly simulate the Boltzmann equation. And in fact, in the 60s, people did not believe that this was a proper way of I think Bird had, had an hard time in showing people that he was really reproducing the physics of, of uh, Boltzmann uh, because he was using, uh, yeah, because he was using this stochastic procedure. So really, in a nutshell, what you would do, you take a collision cell, one cell of your microsolver, you would choose a pair of particles, i and j, in that cell. You would construct this probability, which is, you see, g. See, if you do it dimensionally, you will see the g times sigma, which is a square, is a cross section, so it's length square, over the volume of the cell. This will give, with, you can check it, this will give the probability for the two particles, i and j, to interact in a time step delta t. And you can write this as, a, and here you see that it's dimensionally. Dimensionless is the relative speed times the uh, delta t, which is the length, over the mean free path. So that's the probability for the two particles to interact. And once you build this probability, you do the usual thing. If the random number is small, you collide. If not, you try another pair. And the collision is just mechanical interaction. But now you see why this is consuming, because this test can fail many times. So you have to strive to uh, find conditions such that uh, most tests go through and you accept the collision. So it's a, it's a, as I said, it's, it's a field on its own. But you should know, I think, that if really you need the details of the interatomic, sorry, of the collision process, that's the way to do. But it's an expensive way, and it converges very slowly because, in general, this is it's a, there is noise. It converges with the square root of the number of particles they use. 
although people invented, of course, methods to, to go about it. But it's an entirely different world from the numerical point of view as compared to Lattice Boltzmann or, or methods which solve economic version of the Boltzmann equation. What is the state of your collection of In this case, the particles would live free, both in space and velocity. Which numerical? Oh, no, it's still the distribution function. Is it still distribution? No, no, it's still the distribution function. Well, if you want to be formal, I mean, if you want to be formal in, in the Monte Carlo representation, fxvt would be a sum of delta function, delta x minus xi of t, which is the trajectory of the particle, delta v minus vit, which is the, uh, the loss of the particle. No, no, you choose them at random. You have to sit in a cell which has more or less the size of the interaction range. Okay. And in that cell, you should have, say, 10, 15, 50 parts. Not too many, because otherwise the calculation is too expensive. So you just pick two at random. Okay. Okay? You have their velocity. You construct g. You, sigma you compute, because you are very often in the complicated calculation, sigma is tabulated. But you are supposed, this is an input ingredient of the Monte Carlo. So you can construct the probability that these two particles do interact in the time lapse delta t. But in the end, you have to make the test. And, uh, and uh, this test can fail, for instance, if the, if the, the cross section is small, because the gas is very dilute. This number could be very small. So you have to increase the delta t. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there are many conditions. And it's not trivial to make the Monte Carlo efficient. That depends on the density of your fluid, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, you have to sort many pairs. So if you have 10 particles in the cell, uh, you don't just uh, collide two of them. You collide many. So it's an expensive procedure. But in principle, it is general. So one should know. So summarizing, I think, if you have to summarize what we discussed during the lecture, a general physics notion, ideal aerodynamics away from sharp gradients, of, uh, especially from shots, and gradients associated with non equilibrium and dissipation. That's crucial to distinguish between a local Maxwellian and a distribution, generic distribution. Okay? In a, in a multi scale procedure, the macrodynamics would fix not equilibrium, would fix the fluxes. In this case, zero dissipation. But in general, I would say macrodynamics fixes the fluxes. And the microdynamics micro would restitute equilibrium plus non-equilibrium, because then kinetic theory has capability to compute non-equilibrium uh, quantities. In fact, that's uh, what it has to do to, to resolve the shock. Sampling from equilibrium is easy, but I mean, it's, uh, you, you cannot do it in the nearby the shocks. So you can just lose the purpose of the ordeal. If you just uh, stay away from the shock, your micro region will be so large that the, the penalty in the computation would be too high. And I think this is really where original work is needed. So sampling from non-equilibrium. Safe cycle, but it's challenging. I think it's still an open problem. So up for grabs, you should unleash your fantasy to, to find some clever way of sampling from non-equilibrium. OK, thank you for attention. And tomorrow will be, tomorrow will be a seminar on what we are doing here in, with, uh, with uh, Tim, uh, Simone, and Maria. And it will be basically a seminar more than a lecture. I hope it will be interesting, nonetheless, and stimulate ideas. OK, thank you for being here. <laughs>